世界各地が異常気象に覆われている日本列島でも毎日のように起こる小地震が不気味な地殻の変動を告げそしてついに怪獣たちが一斉に目を覚ましてしまう Well, hey, hey, everyone started the. Oh my god, get out of here! God, can I start the video now? Alright, let's do this. Hello, everyone, Sandwich Face here. It's no secret that copyright law is a nasty, tangled web of corporate power and litigious copyright trolls. YouTube itself has seen its fair share of copyright shenanigans in the past 15 years it's been online. Copyright law is silly and scary, and it makes the life of modders and fan artists a lot harder than it should be. However, if you've been keeping up with the community side of SRB2 recently, you'll notice there's been an ongoing feud between the official SRB2 message board and a splinter site called the SRB2 Workshop. New Sonic Team Jr.'s argument is that SRB2 is an art community, and thus modders should respect the wishes of the artist, while the Workshop would rather stand back and let the community mod without restraint. You might also be aware of a few somewhat recent incidents in the SRB2 cart community involving the banning of a few community modders for plagiarism in the silliest ways possible. Indeed, it's a dumb and lengthy rabbit hole that heavily involves the ever so slightly insane behavior we've all come to expect from Sonic fans at this point. Well, to find out why the SRB2 community is currently embroiled in a keyboard war over creators' rights, we have to take a look at what caused these community splits and questionable community management decisions to begin with. There's a certain policy in the SRB2 community that is followed and enforced somewhat religiously. There are ideas that sound good on paper, but ultimately lead to a lot of pointless drama and nasty community splits that leave everyone unhappy. That's right, it's about time we took a deeper dive into the controversial system known as reusability. Alright, before we get into anything else, what is the reusability system exactly? Well, the reusability system is a sort of license that SRB2 mods and the SRB2 message board are published under. If you've ever downloaded a mod from the SRB2 message board before, which you probably have, you've probably seen this permissions box sitting right here at the top of the page. Well, these right here are the crux of the reusability system. There's two options here, modify and maintain. Basically, anyone who submits a mod to the SRB2 message board can set whether they want their mods to be entirely open source and free to use or not, and whether the mod can be freely maintained. If a mod is reusable, the message board will mark it as open assets and will be completely and totally free to use without limitation. If not, anyone who wants to use any part of a mod for some reason or another will need to get explicit permission from the creator to do so. Additionally, the creator can also set it so that their mods can be freely maintained in their absence. So if they were to disappear from the community for whatever reason, the mod would be caught in a state of creative limbo. Sounds innocuous enough, right? Well, unfortunately, just because something sounds nice on paper doesn't mean it works in practice. Now that we understand what the reusability system is and how it works in theory, let's do some fun exercises to show how it works in practice. So for our first example, let's say little Billy here wants to use a certain Lewis script for his new totally original character, Rankles the Otter. So Billy grabs the script, makes some adjustments, and finally publishes it on the SRB2 message board to decent reception. Billy's happy, the community's happy, and everyone rejoices having more mods to play. However, six months later, another modder, well, let's just call him Timmy, finds out that the Lewis script used in Billy's Rankles mod was taken from an older mod of his. Turns out, our friend Billy misread the permissions for Timmy's mod and thought that a mod he borrowed from was reusable, even though it wasn't. So logically, what do you think happens next? Certainly, a simple misunderstanding like this could be resolved pretty easily, right? Billy's just a kid. Certainly, the community will forgive him. Right? Ouch. Well, that was pretty brutal, if you ask me. But let's move on to our next example and see if things improve. Our second example features this guy here, Johnny. Let's say Johnny hears about an older SRB2 mod from a friend of his, and he tries it out for himself and really enjoys it. In fact, it's so good that Johnny wants to port it to version 2.2 so it can be preserved for future generations. So he gets to work and ports this old mod to version 2.2, and 
and after a few months of hard work, he finishes it and is ready to release it. Unfortunately for our friend Johnny, he has just committed a cardinal sin in the SRB2 community. He has just made a port leg. That's right, poor Johnny didn't get explicit permission to port this ancient mod over to the latest version. Well, shit. So Johnny eventually turns to the outskirts of the community to share his mod, where the main community will forever treat it as an illegal substance and drag his artistic integrity through the mud. A sad story, but unfortunately it's one that has indeed happened before. These examples demonstrate just a few of the major problems of the reusability system, and how much of an absolute headache it is to figure out what the community even wants sometimes. But now that we have a few examples to use as reference, let's break these down further and talk about each issue individually. Problem number one. Reusability stifles creativity. One of the biggest failings of the reusability system is the fact that it makes it more difficult for modders to do as they please. Poor Billy's dreams of SRB2 modding were cut short because of it, after all. It's hard to mod as you please and freely express yourself creatively when there's an entire community of vultures circling you constantly. If I wanted to do anything with someone else's work in this community, here are the steps that I would have to take to ensure this was done in a way that the powers that be would deem appropriate. So first, before doing anything else, I need to carefully check the reusability permissions on the mod's message board thread. If I don't see a yes right here next to modify, or if the mod isn't listed as open assets, I would need to contact the mod creator directly, and wait for a response. If the creator either says no or doesn't respond at all, I'm shit out of luck and progress on my mod has just hit a massive, nigh unscalable wall. Now if you were to say yes, that's great! I can now develop my mod! Until I can't because the mod creator just decided he changed his mind and doesn't want me touching his mod at all, even though I just made great progress on my mod since he gave me permission to use it. Awesome! Tons of progress lost, all because of the creative whims of one singular person. But what if I'm not the only one developing my mod? What if I have a small team of people helping me with a project? Well, unfortunately, the reusability system has no mercy there, either. Let's say you and a small team of people decide to come together to make a big, ambitious mod idea happen. However, disagreements end up happening within the team and your hardest working programmer, who wrote a majority of the project's code, ends up quitting. Now, this is all too common in modern internet culture, but there's more. Turns out, even when your mod is a team effort that involves the hard work of multiple people, reusability still operates on the whims of the individual, rather than the group. So of course, this programmer can now just decide his works are now non-reusable and you have to remove them. That's a large majority of the project code made entirely unusable by the workings of reusability. All of your team's hard work is now effectively nothing, and you need to find another programmer to rewrite nearly the entire project from scratch. Does that sound fair to you? An entire team having months, if not years, of hard work thrown out due to the selfish desires of one person? Reusability truly has no mercy. Now, in any other community on the face of the internet, I could just use the stuff and make sure to give credit to the original creator. Wow, so difficult. So already, the creativity and workflow of the average modder is massively inconvenienced by the reusability system. Additionally, for some bizarre reason, the reusability system allows you to make a mod using nothing but reusable assets and then mark it as non-reusable. This actually just confuses me on so many levels. Like, what work is being protected here? There's nothing new or groundbreaking here to protect, the creator just downloaded a bunch of reusable scripts and then stuffed them together. It's kind of hypocritical to talk about respecting the wishes of the creator with reusability, and then you allow people to take mods the creator specifically wanted to be used by anyone, and then allow other people to decide, yeah, these are non-reusable now, fuck you. That just seems kind of dumb, honestly. Things get even hairier if I just so happen to be an SR2K modder. Say I decide I'm going to make a level pack, and because I'm really excited for Ring Racers, uh, authors know I am not actually excited for Ring Racers, this is just for the sake of the example, I decide to make a few maps loosely inspired by some of the tracks that were, publicly, shown by Kart Crew to be coming to Ring Racers. Sounds fair enough, right? I'm excited for Ring Racers, I like some of the ideas they've shown, so I decided to use those as references and made my own takes on those ideas. Yeah, um, reusability and Kart Crew would like to say otherwise. Unfortunately, Ring Racers is non-reusable, and if you or I make anything that just so happens to look the slightest bit like anything shown in Ring Racers previous, you're in the community's crosshairs now, and you will be violently thrown out of the community while having your name forever associated with art theft. <sighs> so, yeah. Reusability turns what should be a fun, community-driven hobby into a bureaucratic mess of hurdles I have to jump through to get literally anything done. 
and overcoming those hurdles could all amount to literally nothing if some guy decides my mod looks a little bit too much like his. Simply incredible. Problem number two, reusability is tribalistic. As shown in both examples, the community will fight tooth and nail to maintain the status quo of reusability, so much so that the community at times feels like a revolving door of artists and programmers. It's hard to find a time where someone isn't being chewed out for very small non-issues regarding creative rights, honestly. This hot-button nature of usability and creators' rights in the SR2 community can turn any simple misunderstanding into a firestorm of catastrophic proportions. It's simply absurd how seriously everyone takes reusability in this community. Quarrels revolving around reusability and art theft in the SRB2 and SRB2 cart communities have led to such events as the founding of the SRB2 workshop and blue bricks in SRB2 cart. Yeah, anyway. It's hard to be able to enjoy the fruits of SRB2 modding when the different factions of the community are constantly at each other's throats over reusability permissions. To quote a great philosopher, I just want to grill for God's sake. The community staff is so concerned with protecting the rights of artists that people are being driven further and further apart over increasingly smaller issues. I don't care if one pixel of some guy's sprite is the same color as your non-reusable sprite, or if somebody's code has three lines that look vaguely similar to your non-reusable code. It's incredibly annoying and selfish to trample over a good number of other people in this community who don't make mods and don't care about all of this over problems that don't concern any of them. Solve it in private or don't talk about it at all. Problem number three. Port legs are nonsense. One of the terms you'll often hear associated with the reusability system is port leg, but what does that mean exactly? Well, a port leg, as mentioned in example number two with Johnny, is an unauthorized port of an older SRB2 mod to a later version of the game, usually version 2.2 with the current version. Frankly, and excuse my French here, who actually gives a single fuck whether somebody ports your old ancient ass mod to the latest version? Last time I checked, the vast majority of people who play this game only really care about having more mods to play. Honestly, if people really like an old mod from 10 years ago and the creator doesn't give a single shit about SRE2 anymore, what's the problem here exactly? And if that somebody does still care about SRE2 and still hangs around the community, and they're working on an updated remake of that mod for 2.2, well, what if people would still prefer to play the old mod? And what if they'd like to play it with all of the nice quality of life features 2.2 has over previous versions of SRB2? Such as better controls, better performance, and the large pool of mods that are only compatible with 2.2, and not the version the old mod was originally built for. As much as I dislike new Sonic Team Jr., 2.2 has brought a boatload of nice improvements over older versions of SRB2 to the table, and it doesn't seem fair to deny people the right to take advantage of those improvements over reusability shenanigans and flimsy accusations of art theft. Additionally, someone could also be porting an old mod to 2.2 for the sake of preservation. Preservation is a good thing, and it's very important that media is preserved for future generations so that it doesn't become lost and forgotten. Forcing old mods and older versions of existing mods to be locked to those old versions dooms them to the shifting sands of time itself, and will eventually be forgotten if they are not preserved properly. Now, you've probably heard the term art theft a few times in this video and are either understandably annoyed or completely and utterly confused about it. Well, if you've been hanging around the SRE2 community for the past few years or so, you've probably heard new Sonic Team Jr. make some broad statements such as, we're doing this to respect artists, or SRE2 is an art community, when it comes to reusability. Well, SRE2 modders do seem to believe they're making art when they make an SRB2 mod, and granted, if you're a spriter and making custom assets for the game such as a character for example, that is in fact true. However, I'm going to make something very clear to all of you right now. Problem number four, SRB2 is not an art community. Yes, there is more to this game than art. And yes, this is a video game that people play. There are so many people who play SRE2 and enjoy it for a whole lot of things, and it's very foolish to try and lump it all together under the vague banner of art. Some people like SRE2 for the multiplayer, and they like to play things like Ringslinger or Battle Mod or even just regular old co-op. Some people like SRE2 for speedrunning, and some people, like me, just enjoy SRB2 for what it is, a really damn good 3D Sonic fan game made in the Doom engine. I don't think it's fair to all of those people when you scream over them and demand they play the game the way you want them to. People should be allowed to host port legs if they want to, and shouldn't have to face the risk of their server being banned from the master server. People should be allowed to enjoy the hobby of modding without an angry mob coming after them for stepping out of line once. You are not making high art when you mod SRB2, and you have no right to act like you do. You are making mods for a 25-year-old Sonic fan game. 
You've already stolen from Sega, so who the hell do you think you're fooling, honestly? SW2 was, and will always be, a community-driven effort. Same with modding for it. Trying to turn it into a diet Twitter art community is a selfish act driven solely by the egos of a few very vocal people, and forcing the moronic rules of an already moronic space onto an entirely incompatible community has been an unmitigated disaster for SRB2 and its players. Reusability goes against the spirit of modding, the spirit of free software, and the spirit of SRB2 in general. And besides, even on the off case that SRB2 in fact was an art community, all art is derivative. Most, if not all of the greatest and most iconic properties ever are not 100% original ideas. Guaranteed. Godzilla, for example, is very derivative of the Raidosaurus from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. That film in question directly inspired the original 1954 Gojira, as the basic idea of a giant ancient Saurian monster reawakening and coming ashore to wreak havoc on a city is shared between both films. In fact, the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is so deeply rooted into Godzilla's blood that one of the original proposals for the film's title was The Giant Monster from 20,000 Miles Under the Sea. Godzilla himself spawned a huge number of derivative giant monsters as well. The biggest example of this would probably have to be Gamera, but Godzilla also inspired a ton of creature features outside of Japan as well, such as the 1961 British-American film Gorgo and the 1967 Korean film Yangari Monster from the Deep. Hell, even Pokemon, the highest grossing media franchise in the world, is nowhere near original. A number of Pokemon designs in the original 151 are derivative of various Ultraman kaiju or even Dragon Quest monsters. Even the very concept of Pokemon, which was originally pitched as capsule monsters, was directly lifted from Ultra 7. When Dan Moroboshi, the show's protagonist, can't transform into Ultra 7 for one reason or another, he can send one of his three capsule kaiju to fight for him. Dan picks one of his three capsule kaiju and throws their capsule, and the kaiju pops out of it. When his capsule kaiju becomes too weak to fight anymore, he can recall them. Certainly sounds like that one very popular monster collecting RPG from Japan, if you ask me. The point is, with the massive sea of art and media we have available to us, you will never find an idea that is completely 100% original. People take inspiration, people use references, and people just really like one particular thing, and want to talk about it a lot. Squabbling over whether somebody stole your idea or mod is pointless because pretty much every idea has been done already, and they've probably all stolen from each other at one point or another. Well, I think that's just about every major problem with the reusability system discussed in detail. But before I talk about any possible solutions to this ordeal, where did this whole reusability thing come from anyway? More specifically, why is it here at all, not anywhere else? Well, I think I have an answer. This post, made on August 20th, 2020 in the Cart Crew Discord, may just be the origins of the logic the reusability system operates on. If what we see here still holds true, then that means the community staff believes mods are considered intellectual property. However, is this really the right idea? From what I can tell, the legalese surrounding mod copyright is in a weird gray area and I can't really find a consistent answer on it. But we have to ask ourselves, have we really fallen to such a point where we're enforcing copyright law onto a community for a Sonic fan game, a project that would not have been possible without ignoring copyright law to begin with? We give Nintendo all sorts of shit for DMCAing fan projects left and right, but the second we create our own form of strict copyright enforcement, it's suddenly okay? Why do we need to justify a legal reason for the reusability system's existence? While I do feel like I'm repeating myself when I say that we're all stealing the Sonic IP already, it just feels so incredibly corporate and tone-deaf to use this as the justification for so many underlying problems within the community. This is a fan project, made by fans, for fans. The least you could do is respect that. So, in conclusion, the reusability system causes nothing but problems to the SRBG community. It's stifling the creativity of modders within the community, causing team efforts to reach insurmountable dead ends, causing ban after ban and community splits after community splits, and has a blatant disregard for SRB2's history and its roots as a community-driven effort. It's creating a poor work environment for pretty much everyone who mods this game, even if a number of people won't admit it. It's a never-ending spiral of stupidity and selfish thinking that will cause bigger problems in due time if something isn't done about it soon. But what can be done to fix it? Can we fix it at all? Well, the solution I can think of is to quite simply throw it out entirely. All mods should be reusable. End of sentence. Creators should have to agree to provisions that state that anything they create is reusable and can be modified and shared by anyone. However, if someone does create a modification of someone else's work or uses part of someone else's work for something else, they should at the very least give credit to the original creator. You know, like how everyone else on the internet does it. 
but that would require new Sonic Team Jr. to pull their heads out of their asses and understand what they're actually dealing with. But I won't be holding my breath for that, unfortunately. Well, I hope you enjoyed, or tolerated, or even just listened to what I had to say about this whole reusability garbage. I hope I conveyed this better than the last rant video I did. Not a Soybo Jack in sight this time. Unless that one over there counted. Uh, at least I hope it doesn't. Oh well. Alright everyone, if you liked this video, remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell icon, and join the Trashbin Central Discord link in the description down below. I've decided to end this video with a quote from the man himself, SSN Tails. I don't see why people can't port like old stuff. It's just a fan game. I'm stealing Sega stuff, but don't steal mine, K thanks. See you next time, everyone.